In 1971, shocking revelations about law enforcement surveillance were broadcast across the United States. For almost two decades, the FBI, CIA, and other agencies had been abusing their power to monitor activists across the U.S. The reason this information is known is due to a group of activists. They broke into a FBI office and found files of evidence about the illegal activities going on. Today we're going to look at one of the most important heists in U.S. history that many people have no idea about. Let's get started. In 1970, the United States was at war with Vietnam. Within the U.S., anti-war activists were heavily protesting against the government sending troops into the Southeast Asian country. In Philadelphia, activists even resorted to tactics such as petitions, civil disobedience, and hunger strikes to get their point across to the authorities. However, at times, those protests erupted into violent skirmishes with law enforcement, leading to many serious injuries on both sides. Two of the activists in Philadelphia during this time were Bonnie and John Rains. Bonnie worked at a daycare, while John taught religion at Temple University. While they had three children, the married couple wanted activism to also play a major part in their family life. They felt it was important to express discontent lawfully when an authority's action felt wrong. One day, Bonnie was at a rally with her daughter strapped on her back. Bonnie noticed someone nearby was taking pictures of her. She then noticed they took photos of her daughter. They were being surveilled. Bonnie wasn't the only one to feel as though the government were taking liberties with their monitoring. Many protesters complained about similar acts happening to them. They had suspicions that they were being followed. Some even believed their phone calls were being monitored. However, there was no clear evidence that they were being illegally watched, so they could prove it. One of the leaders in the anti-war movement was William Davidon. He was a physics and mathematics professor. He set up a meeting with a small group of other like-minded activists. Bonnie and John Rains, Keith Forsyth, Judy Feingold, and two unnamed activists were present. Another unnamed activist pulled out later, leaving the group with eight members. In this meeting, Davidon told them the plan. They needed proof that the FBI were watching them and doing so without just cause. So they're going to break into their office and gather the incriminating documents. Then they'll send copies of the documents to newspapers and journalists across the country. The public needs to know how far the intelligence agencies are going. To start with, the group were stunned at this escalation. Yet the group also felt they needed to do more. Recently, the protests and marches were making little difference in their view. It was time to step it up and take drastic action if they're going to have any success in their anti-war movement. The group located an FBI office in downtown Philadelphia. However, they soon realized the security was too tight. They wouldn't be able to gain access to it. They needed another location. Quickly, they found a smaller office in Media, Philadelphia. The security in Media was minimal in comparison. They had found their target. They set up the Reigns attic as a staging area to plan the heist. They covered the walls with maps of the local area around the office, all so they could work out a foolproof escape plan after the heist. Then they spent months watching the FBI office. They noted and took photos whenever people went in or out. They also monitored the surrounding areas. They soon knew the routines of the citizens that lived nearby the office. As the group continued canvassing, Forsyth had another task to do. He had to take a course in locksmithing. It was his job to pick the lock on the entrance for the group to get into the office. After a few months, he was ready. While the group knew the surrounding location, they knew very little about the inside of the office. That had to change. Bonnie was chosen to play spy against the spies. She changed her appearance in order to be unrecognizable from the photos the FBI had already taken of her. She even had a backstory as an excuse for being there. Bonnie pretended to be a student at Swarthmore College. She was at the office to conduct research on the opportunities for women within the FBI. Once inside, Bonnie pretended to get lost in the office. This gave her a chance to see the layout of the office in detail. She was able to locate the file cabinets they were going to raid. On top of that, she saw there was no alarm system or security guards in the office. As she looked around, Bonnie also found a second door that led into the office. Just in case, with all the knowledge and preparation completed, the plan was about to come to fruition. The Reigns made arrangements with family and friends to look after their children if anything happens to them. Now they just needed to choose a day to strike. The activists settled on the 8th of March, 1971. That was the day when one of the biggest boxing events of all time was due to happen. Joe Frazier vs. Muhammad Ali for the heavyweight championship of the world. The group made the assumption that a lot of the police officers would be distracted as they listened to the match on their radios. Forsyth's months of learning locksmithing was about to become very useful. He arrived at the office alone. He approached the main entrance door, but disaster struck. The door had a much different lock mechanism than he was expecting. All that training wouldn't help him with this particular lock. He considered calling off the theft and trying again another time. However, they might not get an opportunity like this again. Then he had a thought, the second entrance door that Bonnie found. When he located it, it only took him 20 seconds to pick the lock. But a second problem hit him. 
the door was locked with a deadbolt on the other side. Forsyth grabbed his crowbar and started to pry the door open. He hoped that the noise from the crowbar wouldn't tip off anyone inside. Soon he heard a noise within the office, but he kept going regardless. Quickly, the rest of the group arrived at the door. They were all dressed in business suits and were holding suitcases. They immediately went to the file cabinets and placed all the documents into their bags. They had over 1,000 files altogether. Once they had everything, they left and got into the getaway car nearby. They drove for an hour and stopped at an isolated farmhouse to review their heist. The activists then spent several nights going through their treasure trove. They separated the most condemning files out with plans to photocopy them. They saw the phrase, Cointel Pro, written on documents every so often. But the group had no idea what it could possibly mean. They then wrote out a cover letter and called themselves the Citizens Commission to investigate the FBI. They popped the letter and the copies of the documents into envelopes and sent them to the selected journalists. One of the receivers of the package was the Washington Post's Betty Medsker. She glanced at the first file and was astounded. The document told the FBI agents to enhance the paranoia in the anti-war movement. They wanted to create the impression that there was an FBI agent behind every mailbox. A lot of the damaging documents came directly from the office of the FBI director, J. Edgar Hoover. The attorney general of President Nixon's administration, John Mitchell, got in touch with the Washington Post. He requested that they don't run the story. He claimed that if the newspaper did, lives could be at stake. The Post thought on the request, but decided to place the story on the front page of the newspaper on the 24th of March, 1971. They examined the documents further in their report. It stated that at a local college, the local police chief, the postmaster, letter carriers, campus security officers, and switchboard operators were all involved with surveilling activist groups and individuals in the area for the FBI. The world was now learning of the grim extent the intelligence agencies, especially the FBI, were going to in the name of safety, regardless of whether a couple of amendments were broken in the process. Once the break-in was known about, the FBI were livid. J. Edgar Hoover had now had his dodgy tactics exposed. The FBI put 200 agents on the case of finding the identity of the activist robbers. They had a clear description of, quote, the college girl that visited the media office before the theft. However, due to Bonnie's grand disguise, the description could fit thousands of activist women. The FBI were stumped, but they were desperate to find the culprits. A number of years after the files were released, NBC journalist Carl Stein uncovered more documents about Cointelpro. It was a shorthand phrase for counterintelligence program. From 1956 until 1971, when the files were released, Cointelpro was a specific program used by the FBI and the CIA. They spied on various groups, leaders, and figures within the activist realm, especially in regards to the civil rights movement. Muhammad Ali was one such person that was watched due to his ties to activist groups. The list of people monitored and spied on contained diplomats, sports athletes, activists, senators, and congressmen, one of which was Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. They mentioned that they knew about his extramarital affairs. They finished by darkly stating, quote, there is only one thing left for you to do. You know what that is, end quote. Many more citizens had their phones tapped, mail read, and tax returns examined illegally, all under the Cointel Pro initiative. The government created the Church Committee in 1975 to create reforms for the intelligence services. They were to rein in their surveillance programs and allow the government to have more oversight. The new permanent FBI director, William Webster, was told that Cointel Pro was to be disbanded permanently. The cost of such changes for the FBI reform are unknown. However, in 2013, Edward Snowden released a number of leaks about the NSA spying on over a billion people across the world. The NSA's budget was discovered to be $10.5 billion for 2013. The following year, as part of the reforms into the NSA's antics, an incredible $1.1 trillion was set aside in a bill to aid in the reform. In 1975, the same reforms would have cost around $250 billion of taxpayer money the same taxpayers the intelligence agencies monitored relentlessly and illegally. In 1976, the FBI called off the hunt for the robbers, three days after the five-year statute of limitations had expired. The case was closed and unsolved. In the final memo in the case, the FBI had narrowed the suspects down to seven people, only one of which was actually involved in the heist. For 20 years, Betty Medsker had no idea of the true identities of those responsible for leaking the valuable information. But one night during dinner, John Raines told his friend that he was involved. In 2014, Medsger released the book, The Burglary, The Discovery of J. Edgar Hoover's Secret FBI. She pieced together the story for the world to know. In that same year of 2014, a documentary by Johanna Hamilton about the heist was released titled 1971. 
without that daring theft by a group of passionate activists looking to stop, in their view, an unjust war, there's a good chance the world would not have known about the illegal surveillance and the COINTELPRO initiative. However, some argue that the price of safety is worth the cost of freedom and privacy. We'll leave that up to you to decide. And that's it. What do you think about this activist heist? Did they do the right thing or not? Pop your thoughts in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video, please like, share, and subscribe to The Richest and click the bell. That way you can be notified whenever we release new content. Finally, thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time.